Welcome to A Look Ahead. As we presume you may know, uh, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first quarter of 2013. It's a series entitled Origins, and this is lesson number 11 in that series. This lesson is entitled Sabbath, A Gift from Eden, and this is a lesson for March 16 of 2013. We'd like you to get your Bible if you have it handy, and we'd also like you to bow your heads with us as we begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we think back to what we imagined were the, was the situation in the time of the Garden of Eden, we wish we could see it. We wish we could have even a slight hint of, of how marvelous and wonderful it was in the days when you walked in the cool of the evening with your new family, your new friends, Adam and Eve. But we look forward to the day when that true situation might be the case once again. And remember that one of the things that we do have still available to us from that Edenic home is the Sabbath. Be with us now as we discuss it, we think about it, may we gain the maximum amount of benefit from it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're delighted to have with us this week again. Uh, Dr. James Gibson, the head of the Geoscience Research Institute here at Loma Linda, who happens to be the author of this series of lessons. And last week he told us something about the process that you have to go through to create such a series of lessons, and I understand it's a lot of work. Time consuming, a lot of work, and takes several years in the whole process, not your particular time, which was probably several months, but and the process of going through all the editing and all the ever, everything to get to where we are here at this time. I have a question. Yeah. We talked about the lesson guide, but not this additional book. Can you explain what goes into this additional book yeah. that you did? Please. Yes, after the lessons were completed and I thought I was done, <laughs> someone contacted me and said, well, would you mind writing a companion book? Huh? And I said, well, yeah, I'll do that. It, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to put some, to develop thinking and, yeah. and, and organize it and so on. So uh, we, we prepared this uh, companion book, um, published separately from the uh, quarterly, but the companion book also has 13 chapters. Mm -hmm. Each one is, corresponds with the Sabbath School lesson, but it has material in it that is presented more in a, uh, a, an essay form rather than a teaching format, you know, questions and answers and things. And there's an opportunity to maybe put a little supplemental material in there. And uh, you remember the Sabbath School lesson is going not only to the university people in Loma Linda, it's also going out to the people in West Africa who may not be able to read, you know, and they have to listen. And so it has to be a broad enough uh, and simple enough in its language that it can be used worldwide. We could do a little bit more uh, uh, supplemental material with with this, and maybe some things that people would be uh, who are more interested in who thought about it longer. But of course, it's still a, a fairly simple, short book. It's not very long, mm -hmm. but it was kind of fun to write. And, yeah, uh, lots of uh, interest in that. <laughs> It's available at the ABC. It's available. It's actually available at Amazon. Yeah, I'm sure. So you wrote that second then. Yes, it came after the lessons. Mm -hmm. The one thing that's different in this book, the final chapter in this book is on worldviews, mm -hmm. whereas in the lesson quarterly, it's on the recreation mm -hmm. and restoration. But here I sort of summarize looking back through the whole topic and talking about how worldviews are, are need to be internally coherent and co consistent and uh, some of the implications of that for various theories. Very good. Well, in this lesson, we're going to focus on some of the many reasons that we believe we have for celebrating the Seventh-day Sabbath. Think about that very first Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. Um, here's God. He has done a careful methodical, planned creation over six days and then this day of rest. And um, at what point in time did we join the party? Day 5.5. 5. 
<laughs> about five and a half days into the sequence, didn't we? So the Sabbath was really our first full day. Mm-hmm. Was that for man or woman? Both. Mm-hmm. Both on that man, day. Man a little okay. earlier than woman. Okay. Yeah. Not much. Yeah. Not much. So, and, and what do you think the universe was doing on that day? The beings and the rest, the angels and the other beings in the other worlds. What, what do you suppose they were doing on that first Sabbath? Well, obviously, they were looking at the finished product. Mm-hmm. And you think they were celebrating? you think they were happy about what they saw? Yeah, and um, you kind of wonder, um, what were they so happy about? Mm-hmm. Well, and there's a clue. We, we, we don't have to sort of guess, do we? Uh, although, I, if you want to know details about that, you might have a problem. But, but look at Job uh, 38, verse 7. Uh, 38, verse 7. And God, in Job 38, up to 41, God's talking about some of his creative activities. And here's the, it's only seven verses into that. He says, in the dawn of that day, the day when he was creating the world, the stars sang together, and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Now, if you know about Hebrew parallelism, you know that stars goes with heavenly beings and sang together, goes together with shouted for joy. So this suggests that the entire universe was shouting for joy and celebrating when God finished his creation. Well, don't you think they had some concept that sin had entered heaven already Mm -hmm. and was causing a problem? And God now is laying out his plan for the, for the solution to this sin problem. Mm-hmm. And now here's a group of creatures that has abilities that have been given to them that the angels didn't have. Yeah. They're rejoicing that God is taking care of this sin problem. Yeah. They're going to watch it take place. Mm-hmm. Also, Earth had to be a very special place because there's nothing that we have found that have the same environment air and um, around the planet. There's so still a lot of places to look. I know, but <laughs> Earth had to be a special place. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Now remember, let's be clear about this. The Sabbath, this Sabbath was God's seventh day. It's not our seventh day. So we are joining God in celebrating this seventh day. Okay? What do you think, if we get into the mind of God, what do you think was his main reason for celebration at on this day. Norma suggested one possibility. Any other ideas? To provide rest and a form of uh, not justice, if you will, because soon uh, slavery will be rampant and it provided rest for people who had to just work, 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 work. When they died, they just were, they were mixed with the yeah. thing and just, yeah. And I, I agree that that came down the line. I'm talking about, suppose you were there on that very first Sabbath, you didn't have any idea what was coming. I think God was happy to have some companionship that he could share that time with. Mm. And surely he must have enjoyed pointing out to Adam and Eve the little insect over in the corner that they may have not, not have noticed, and the little flower over here and all its beauty, mm. and all the little things that he'd made so that he would l- teaching them to open their eyes and look yes and see absolutely. the marvelous beauty and diversity kind of a celebration day yes of course a and, memorial and, day if you will and i i i think it would be a big mistake for us to limit that to just adam and eve i think the entire universe was watching as god took adam and eve around and said look at this look at this you know you can eat this stuff look look at that pick one of those and <laughs> taste it you know and the universe was saying man God did a marvelous job, didn't he? You know, what does that say about God? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a God that wants companionship with what he creates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, what we see here is, and we shouldn't be any, find it any, any surprise at all, that God intended for us to go on celebrating what he did during that first week. You asked uh, for a reason why. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of those that we get from Ellen White, that if Adam and Eve and his posterity 
had enjoyed the Sabbath and, and, and had loved it and had come to it, there would have never been an evolutionist. Yeah. There would never have been a lot of the things that we have that now. Uh, there's comments about that coming up in our lesson. But some people have looked at some places in Scripture, for example, in Deuteronomy 5, where the Jews have just come out of Egyptian slavery and God says, keep the Sabbath. And they said, oh, right, fine. And then 40 years later, God says, keep the Sabbath because I, I, I got you out of slavery. Um, so does that mean that maybe the celebration of creation really isn't that big a deal? Um, you know, one well, time you can... be tied together. They can be tied together? Do it. Well, let's do it through our lesson, okay? Look at a few verses. Look at Genesis 2, starting with verse 1. And so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He, he wasn't tired. It was time for him to stop. He was done. He finished. He did a good job. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day. Because by that day, he had completed his creation and stopped working. And that is how the universe was created. You think that's a reason for celebrating? I think it's a reason for celebrating when you finish a project. Mm -hmm. But I don't <laughs> always conveniently finish it on Friday just before Sabbath. I've always, I mean, so that was wonderful. God finished and then he rested. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting to notice something which we don't have time to spend a lot of time on, but God apparently knew in his foreknowledge that this world, that he's now populating with the small garden of Eden, putting Adam and Eve here, he knew that finally, eventually, after the whole sin thing had taken place, this was going to be his future home, God's future home. This will be the new earth. When the New Jerusalem comes down, God will be, this will be God's headquarters. Do you think he thought about that when he was going through that first uh, week of creation? Sure. In his infinite foreknowledge, I am absolutely sure he knew that. Okay. I think he was thinking about that the day he created Satan. Sure. Or Lucifer Before at that created. point in time. <laughs> yeah. And isn't that amazing that God would choose the most sinful place in the whole universe to have his home in the future? Yeah. Ah. For a reason. But there, what happened down here because of that was the most glorious representation of love that could ever be conceived. All of heaven was emptied of the hoarded glories and benefits that they have, dumped down here, that's the wrong word, but put down here to, to solve the sin problem. What a thing to rejoice about. Mm -hmm. And expanded the finite being's understanding about the infinite one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, had, had he not done that, and you wouldn't get an approach going to the right direction about the expansion. Well, it, it takes the universe and puts it secure from anything like this again. It just seems like it would be the obvious place for to rejoice forever over that particular event. Just yeah. a word. We do have to remember that sin began in heaven, right next to God's throne, mm -hmm. amongst his closest not being, closest. not here on earth. Right. It came here. Right after it was first in heaven. Well, but, you know, one of the big arguments that's been around for a number of years now and, and, and is really taken over much of the thinking of much of our world, even the Christian world, is that there were probably not seven regular days. There were probably significant time periods that would, that this, may, some kind of semi-evolutionary process took place. Is there any evidence in the Bible that there was any thinking like that? I'd like to go down close to the end of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and look at these words. We who believe then do receive that, that rest which God promised. It is just as he said, I was angry and made a solemn promise they will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. Now, this is a reference to way down at this, at this near the end of the Bible, to the idea that God created in seven days, back in the beginning, and 
Paul was aware of it, and, and if we had time, we could quote many places, and even in the New Testament, suggesting that God had created everything, spoke it by his words and so forth. And, and um, what, is there any allowance in the scriptures for the idea of long time periods? Or were they were just too ignorant to have thought that up? Jim, is there? <laughs> no, no there's the, the, in lesson four, we made that point. Mm -hmm. And that is that the creation story that you find in Genesis is the basis for all the references to creation through the rest of the scripture. They all mesh with that, with that with single that story. story. Yep. So why don't we just prove that there was a creation week? And then be done, have it be done with. How would you do that? That's the question. How would you do that? You must, ex you must first of all agree on the nature of the evidence that's acceptable for proof. Yes. The theorems and axioms of the, the geometry. Exactly. And if that, if that, uh, if, if those fundamental uh, assumptions are the integrity of Scripture, then you can prove it because the Scriptures do t do show it. But scientifically and empirically, yeah. of course. That's history. We can't yeah. go back and do history. You can't prove anything from history. It's, you can say we have evidence that it happened, but you can't prove it. Now, there's two ways we could <coughs> theoretically prove, and I'm using that in quotation marks. One would be if God decided to show us a video <laughs> of exactly how it happened. And, or the other way would be for him to do it over again. Just, well, this is the way I did it. Look, watch. However, I can assure you that if God did that, either one of those ways, the critics would still not accept it. They would say, well, but maybe the video was, was it it doctored, or maybe it was done in a studio, or whatever. Well, but if you can't prove history, how can you prove evolution? You can't prove you evolution. Can't. Well, you can't prove either one. You no. can't prove there is no God. And no, you can't prove there is a God. Wait a minute. I don't quite understand with not proving history all the way. The well, the way you're taking it, because... Lots of people have gone to jail over proof of history. Well, it's not proof. No, it's no. beyond a reasonable no. doubt. Yes, exactly. But that stops short of actual demonstration. But um, what okay, if I said maybe maybe wouldn't be enough proof to actually send anybody to jail, but there would be enough proof there maybe to suggest evidence, not proof. Enough. Yes, certainly. You have evidence. But evidence is proof. Example. No. Me, no, evidence no, is not no, proof. no, 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 no. It can be proof. Evidence is within the realm of proof. Evidence may lead to beyond reasonable doubt. It's not proof. And, and uh, what, example, what, what? Say that again. Evidence may lead to a case where you say, okay, it's beyond reasonable doubt, but it's not proof. I thought when they say that there's evidence, it's proof. No. Uh, well, it isn't? Proof you know is law. something that you can make happen now. Yeah. Well, and, and let's look at that. There are, our friend Ahmadinejad, and the leader of, of Iran, says that he thinks the whole Holocaust thing in World War II was all a myth. So how would you like to prove to him that it really happened? Well, there's bones and piles and... <laughs> there's well, there's, places. There are there's um, there you know, when you talk about rebellion, proof doesn't do anything for him. Right. That's that's our point. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask paradigm of preconceived errors. Yes, go ahead. I would like to ask if you agree there's a difference between empirical science and historical science, and if so, what is the difference? The main difference in empirical. Well, empirical. I would use experimental. Empirical means based on it's some sort of uh, physical evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, hi experimental science, you start with some defined initial conditions and you observe the result of disturbing the system and you get some result. And you can do that again and again because the initial conditions are defined. Historical science, you have a, a result that was produced before <coughs> and you have to try to figure out what were the initial conditions that led to that result. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. One moves forward, the other moves backward. backwards. Yeah. And also the one going backwards is more subjective or not. Ooh, and there's well, more supposition yeah. involved in... How did that book get there? Is there just one explanation, or might oh. there be a hundred explanations? Oh, even thousands. Yes. <laughs> well, you can eliminate some, you know, but, but an, a cause, an effect may be produced by more than one cause. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it's very difficult to have the same degree of competence in explaining causes mm -hmm. as it is in explaining effects. Results, yeah. mm -hmm. Ellen White put it in these words, the Word of God, like the character of its author, presents mysteries that can never be fully comprehended by finite beings. But God has given in the scriptures sufficient evidence of their divine authority. His own existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. True, he has not removed the possibility of doubt. Faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt have opportunity, but those who desire to know the truth find ample ground for faith. That's Ellen White's book, Education, page 169, and something quite similar to that in the book, Steps to Christ, page 105. Evidence, but not proof. Would that be a fair uh, summary of what she's saying there? Well, if you're saying proof is, what do you call it? Um, proof would be, okay, there's no other possible explanation for this. Bang. It happened like this. No other explanation. No other possible explanation. Okay. If you want to define it that way, that would be... Can we also agree there is private and public evidence? Because my yeah. evidence, my relationship with God is so private, I cannot mm -hmm. lend it to you. I cannot... It's, it's very real. Sure. It's very private. Mm -hmm. And I believe God could have created there in six seven seconds rather than seven days mm -hmm. and I believe in God totally and love him and worship him and at the same time I can believe what science say about uh, uh, what radioactive uh, dating and certain things because it's, it's it I, it comes I, I have a conundrum sometimes where to separate and where to meld mm -hmm. the two and but my belief in God is cannot be changed because it's mm -hmm. it's personal, it's real. But there are things also that I believe in that science has proven to a certain degree. And I believe whatever people have, whatever gift it was given for, uh, uh, to us, it came from God. Mm -hmm. And I think one more thing, if I may, and I believe uh, anthropologists more than other than any other that I've seen have done more to prove what's in the Bible than disprove it. Mm -hmm. Jim, did you say that there's what is called a tension between evolution and creation for scientists? There's a, there's a tension between the story the Bible tells and the story that the scientists tell. They tell different stories. We try to resolve those we resolve them. There's different ways of resolving them. The criteria that I would use to determine whether a particular proposed solution is acceptable or not is whether it's consistent with Scripture. But some folks would say it must be consistent with science. A person, how do you make that decision? Mm -hmm. That is not a scientific <laughs> choice. That's a philosophical choice. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, skeptics say that the first 11 chapters of Genesis, this is talking about creation up through the events of the flood, um, are talking about things in the impenetrable past. Thus, they call them myths. <coughs> now, what does it mean by myth? A myth doesn't mean necessarily that's wrong. It just means we have no way of checking it out. It's a story that's been passed down. We have no idea how much of it's true and how much of it's false. So how do we choose some of us to believe those established, those, those stories as established facts? Do we have adequate reasons for our faith? And the, the bottom line to all that would be, can God be trusted? If we believe this book is inspired by God, then the question is, can we trust him? Do we believe the biblical record or shall we believe the devil's claims, who, by the way, Jesus called the father of lies? Does that influence your, your, your tendency to trust him? The Sabbath was established specifically to allow us time to evaluate the evidence that God has so generously provided. And this is a quotation that Norm sort of referred to easier, e earlier. This is in Great Controversy, page 437, paragraph 2. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, 
man's thoughts and affections would never, uh, I'm sorry, would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. The keeping of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to the true God, him that made heaven and earth to see in the fountains of water. And you recognize, I hope, Revelation 14, mm -hmm. verse 7. It follows that the message which commands men to worship God and keep his commandments will especially call upon them to keep the fourth commandment. Now, um, explain to me, I mean, I believe it, but how would you explain what the Sabbath does that keeps people from being evolutionists? Well, if you truly keep the Sabbath, meaning you, your respect for the Creator, your recognition of what He did in those first seven days, etc., and you always believe that, you're not going to end up being a doubter, you're not going to end up being an evolutionist. The biblical record is quite clear if you accept it as, as a fact. If and the Sabbath is a memorial of creation, yeah creation by God in seven literal days. You can't believe that and be an evolutionist. But if, how do you get to that point where you believe that God is the creator? I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can look at nature and see it and, and you can come up with stuff that evolutionists come up with. Because when you get looking done, at that. it'll be a philosophical choice. Jim, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> a couple of points here. One is, if you, you're you looking at this tension and you're saying, I could choose scripture or I could choose science to resolve the tension, mm -hmm. but I've got some issues that I can't resolve. If, I am, if I'm looking at science, what do I have to call upon to get me out of this mess? Mm -hmm. to resolve my problems. I have the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. That's what I have. That's all I have. If the laws of physics are not explaining my problem, then I have a problem that cannot be solved in that thought system. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm going with the Bible, I have a, a God, a God who's infinite. He can solve any problem. Mm -hmm. Of course, scientists would criticize on that basis, but that's not a weakness, it's a strength. Any problem I can have, I may not know the answer, but I can believe that God who created the whole universe and, and is responsible for every, every aspect of physical reality, he certainly knows the answers to these things. Mm -hmm. You think that but it, the, the role of prophecy may help in, in people's uh, belief system? Because here you got a book that he talks about creation, but it also got some things about tell, foretelling the future. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Jesus says, you know, it's, it's not for the pur purpose of our prediction. It's so that when that event happens, and we can look down through this book, and that, that there's some, maybe this thing has some other th things of truth in here that we can hang it. I, that's, that's for me. And that, of course, is the main point of Isaiah 40 to 55 in the Old Testament. Very clearly, Isaiah says, you know, you gotta, we, we're surrounded by people worshiping all kinds of crazy things and calling them gods. Okay. In, in effect, Isaiah said, let's, let's, let's have the real God please stand up. And he said, our God can create out of nothing. He can predict far in advance. He can perform miracles. What can your God do? Well, we have, you, have to, you, have to, you have to nail him down and prop him up so he stand up straight. You can make him out of, you know, you cut down a tree and you use half of it for warm yourself on the other half or maybe to cook your food and the other half you make a God. I mean, Give me a break. What, what, what would happen? I got a question. What would happen if a spiritual person actually had something he believed that was wrong? We all do. And somebody tries to prove that it's wrong, and then he comes back and says, well, God can do anything. He can fix it. He can wow. do anything. So, so then what would be his guidance then if God could fix anything he believes that's in to be right. That's exactly why God says to keep studying the Bible. 
because every time you go through and other inspired, we, we believe in the writings of Ellen White. We need to be constantly checking everything we believe against the inspired record. And you'll, you'll const if you're doing that, you will constantly find things where you're in error. That's the whole point. I am. I am. Now my turn. <laughs> sure. uh, on this uh, tension, okay, and then you say you make a decision as a scientist if the laws of physics are God. Um, then, as you proceed through your career, does your decision make a difference on what you see in an experiment, what you see in things? Or can a scientist <laughs> separate his decision from uh, his uh, conclusions uh, as they come in the future? Al almost all organisms have the same genetic code. The correlation between triplets of nucleotide bases and amino acids by which they make proteins. Mm -hmm. To an evolutionist, that is one of the uh, lines of evidence he sees for common ancestry of all organisms. To a creationist, that's one of the lines of evidence he sees for a common designer, a common creator of all organisms. So it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. Once you've made your decision... But well, not, not on the objective measurements of the experiment. It makes a difference on the way you interpret yes. the, 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 the facts both, of the experiment. We both see the same genetic right. code. That's right. not different. But it, it does make a difference in what you look for. Yes. Uh, if you are expecting to find something or if you're asking a particular question, you're going to look for evidence pertaining to that. If you are thinking something might be different, you're looking for a different kind of evidence. That doesn't mean that one person's going to come to a wrong and another to a right conclusion. It just means that some people will see some things more clearly than others. Other people will see perhaps different things from the same data set. You know, and I know, that there have been scientists who have spent their whole life trying to demonstrate something, and fortunately some of them have got clear non close to the end of their lives, and all of a sudden the world recognizes, hey, you were right all along. But all the scientists disagreed with them for many, many years, and finally said, oh yeah, there is a good point there, isn't there? So yeah. But let, let, me, let me bring us back. Remember we're talking about the Sabbath here. Does this bother you? Deuteronomy 5. I'm reading from verses 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do, and everybody's happy so far. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. So if I'm not a Jew, I don't need to keep the Sabbath. Let's look at Revelation 14, 6 okay. and 7. Yeah. <laughs> Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who created heavens and the earth and the seas and the fountains of water. You have sort of a parallelism there in a sense. You have the judgment and you uh, fear God because of judgment and worship him who created. Mm -hmm. There you have judgment and creation linked together. Mm. There is actually a link between them. In Exodus 20, you have creation. In Deuteronomy 5, you have judgment. Mm -hmm. To the Hebrew, judgment was not about punishment and conviction. Judgment was about release and freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, and, and if, if you want evidence of that, look through the Psalms and they say, how long until you judge? Yeah. That was often uh, uh, yeah. spoken. So the freedom in Deuteronomy 5 and the creation in, Gen in Exodus 20 are linked together. And the reason, one reason they're linked together is because the only way we can obtain freedom is through the power of the Creator. Yeah. Yeah, but... Mm. Um, yeah. What's what's being judged? But God's being judged. Everything. Well, what's being judged? I mean, look every, at every day when 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 God cr finished in his creation, he called it good, mm -hmm. right? He did his judgment right there. When um, 
when the Hebrews were freed from Egypt, the Hebrews called it good. At least they did until they, they finally got out, you know, type of thing. But boy, they were wondering about whether it was going to be good or not. So I'm wondering what the judge, when you said judgment, I thought maybe you were talking about God judging the Egyptians. Judgment has two aspects, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the judgment is to free the captives. In order to do that, there's a punishment on the captors. At the end of the world, the purpose is to save those who have chosen God. But in order to do that, the others have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But So there's a, there's a twofold. But to the saved, judgment is good news. But it's all work, though, of God. Yes. All of it's yes. work of God. Yes. And it looks like there's judgment being made on whether it's good or not. Mm -hmm. right. Well, Another word, another judgment is when you make a decision or you make an evaluation, you are, you are performing a judgment on something. And it depends on who you're talking about in, in this scenario. If you're a person looking at what God is doing, you may be making a judgment about God on the basis from, from your perspective. God is up here making decisions about who he's going to have with him for eternity. That's an entirely different, a different perspective. So you can say it's God's judgment, but you have to tell in whose mind are you, are you, are you looking. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, a, there's yeah. a third reason for keeping Sabbath. It's yeah. given in Ezekiel 20. Yes, I was just going to read that. Okay, please do. Yeah, Ezekiel 20, and look at verse 12. Uh, I'm reading from the Good News Bible. I made the keeping of the Sabbath a sign of the agreement between us to remind them that I, the Lord, make them holy. And there's other places. Um, and for example, Exodus 31. We can go way back to Exodus. The Lord commanded Moses to say to the people of Israel, Keep the Sabbath my day of rest because it is a sign between you and me for all time to come to show that I, the Lord, have made you my own people. So what is God's plan? God's plan is that the Sabbath is a time when we meet with him. We celebrate together. And God says, if you're celebrating the Sabbath, I'm going to take that as a, a, a time when I will bless you, a time when I will help you to understand as you're studying uh, these truths. It's a time when we grow together. We become, Jesus even said in John 17, I want you to become so close to me that it's just like my relationship to the Father. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what kind of, what could we ask for more than that? I mean, if Sabbath is a, is a sign of this covenant between us, I don't know how we could ask for anything better is than that. Is God saying, um, during the Sabbath, give me time to fix you? He's saying, the way I fix you is that we come together and we share as friends. And as you get to know me better, and if, if you like what you see, which you will if you really understand it, I believe, then yes, it will, it will transform you. But what does, the, what does the sign say? The sign says, we have an agreement. We, between God and us, we say, this is our, this is our agreement together. We will spend this 24-hour period together as friends. So... We have to come and see him at that appointed hour for the sign to We have a say. date. We have a date. We have a date for right. it. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect. If you, I don't want to interrupt. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. The, sign, the Sabbath is a sign that I, mm -hmm. God, am the one who sanctifies you. Yes. You do not earn sal salvation no. yourself. Right. Salvation is a gift. Mm -hmm. God is the one who gives it to us. Yeah. And that is fact, that necessity goes back to the fact that we were created without flaw and we fell and now we need fixing. Healing. Yeah. We need healing. And God is the only one who can give us yeah. healing, which is one of the reasons I, can, I cannot see how the theory of theistic evolution can work with the gospel because in theistic evolution you're getting better. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you get better eventually, you've probably heard people talk about the God that's within you. Let, mm. let the good things come yeah, out your right. inside, you're all good. No, that's not right. 
the Bible talks about the heart being deceitfully and desperately wicked, yeah. not that we're naturally good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, this is a criterion by which theories can be judged. Mm -hmm. You know, we, and, and to support your point, we hear people arguing all the time about justification by faith and sanctification by faith and righteousness by faith and salvation by faith. And if you stop and those things, line those up, what do you see? You see, all of them are by faith. Our part is trusting God. His part is justification, sanctification, righteousness, salvation. He's the one that does all the hard work. All we have to do is trust him. And, and that's, I mean, you can't trust somebody you don't get to know. So the Sabbath is a time to get to know God. And if you get to know God and you come to trust him, marvelous things will happen. I mean, he's never lost a case. This is not a 50% a physician. He, what, he, what happens if you come to trust God on Sunday? And well, that's, you, that's fine. But God says, I, it's, it's like, what, what if I said to you, I know your birthday is on, I don't know, January 20. But uh, it's inconvenient for us to worship, I mean, to celebrate on that day. Uh, I would like to, we'll, we'll celebrate on February too. Would that be all right with you? Seems to work on President's Day. <laughs> well, yeah, we. Well, God says, I'm glad for you to worship me on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You're my friend every day, mm -hmm. but I've got something special on, sa on the yeah. Sabbath. Something's, there's something more. Yeah. It's a date. Yes, it's, it's a, a date, but God meets, God meets with people of good faith at any time they can come to him. Any day. But there's something about Sabbath that only comes on Sabbath. And I think that, yes, and I absolutely agree with you. And, and part of that is that's a time when we all get together. You know, if I, if I make a date with God on Sunday, I may be doing it by myself, you know, or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. But I know that God has set aside this special day on Sabbath and we're, a group of us are going to come together and we're going to celebrate together. And, you know, we're just crazy enough as human beings that if we, if we celebrate by ourselves all the time, we may find ourselves off into some crazy notions. We need to come together as we're doing here and say, yeah, Gary, that's a good idea. Gordon, that's a good idea. But, you know, we have to sort of, you know, I try to figure out how to put all these ideas together so we come up with a, a good composite whole. I still struggle with one thing that may not be politically correct to say. I struggle with the notion that every word in the Bible is inspired. Mm -hmm. Because when we say so, I know some people at some level believe that, period. But when we say that, we have to also question, was Constantine inspired? because every word in the Bible is not simply history. There's political uh, things, there's so many other things mm -hmm. that are conflated in this book mm -hmm. that we have to have such a relationship with the Creator that we're able to decipher man-made yeah. construct and God, things that God decreed. And I have, I will, I, there's, I mm. cannot say. You mean you you need a parody bit as you read the Bible to no, straighten that's things I mean. up? No, 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 that's well, not what I mean but, at but all. But here, yeah, well, well, that's what I mean. If you say that, if you say you wonder if the Bible, if every word is correct, I don't is wonder. Is that what you're saying? I don't just wonder. I believe there are things. What I we know, if we really want to speak what we know from history, that this book, Constantine did things and he took, th okay, it wasn't Peter, Mark, and Paul that took pen and paper and wrote it as we have it today. Mm -hmm. We have to be honest. To some point, that's not what it is because at a certain point, there are things that were taken away. There were things that were fixed in a certain way for political reasons as well. So we have to have a relationship enough with God that we're able to accept because I find some things that must that hurt God. The God represented sometimes is not the kind of God that you want to worship. Well, you know, on Theox, there's a whole series of lessons Ken did on the history of the Bible mm -hmm. and how the history of the Bible came to be. And mm -hmm. a lot of those questions are answered in that series. That's a, that's a huge subject it that is. we don't obviously have time to deal with right now. Look, look at some examples about how Jesus dealt with uh, the Sabbath. 
we don't have time to read them now, but Matthew 12, 9 to 13, Luke, 10, Luke 13, 10 to 17, and John 5, 1 to 17, are cases where Jesus came across people who had long-standing diseases, and he healed them on the Sabbath. Do you think he did that on purpose? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? There were uh, edicts out not to do that on the Sabbath. Yes. So Jesus did it on the so Sabbath. He, was, he says, this rebel is going to do it whether you like it or not. He tried to give the pro tweak the, me the true, get back toward the true meaning of the Sabbath as opposed to the rigid. Well, he was showing that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Right. Mm. So, so, so let's, let's make a distinction here. Is there any indication in Scripture that Jesus thought, well, maybe we shouldn't really be worshiping on this particular seventh day. We ought to be worshiping on some other day? No. no. What was he trying to prove by the way he treated the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made for man. Yes. And? Not man. Not Expand man on that Sabbath. even but more. What does that mean, the Sabbath was made for man? Well, in the context that Jesus said it, of course, he, he said, the Sabbath is the servant of man. Man is not the servant of the Sabbath. I think that's what he yeah. means there. Well, but in a broader sense, in this application here, in the context of what we're talking about, the Sabbath is made for the restoration of man, mm -hmm. for the benefit of man. The Sabbath is a blessing for yes. man, a present for man. Is that why? A memorial day for us to remember the wonderful works that God has done for us. And it's what all other for us. Yeah. Everything's for us. And so, he in, loves in us. that context, would it be all right to heal the sick on the Sabbath? Yes. Would it be all right to do good to, for the poor on the Sabbath? We spoke about animals before. It's okay to yeah. pull an animal out of a hole on the Sabbath. Yeah, exactly. It's okay to let your animals rest on the Sabbath. It's well, okay to be Sabbath nice to people on the for Sabbath. Animals too. Sabbath yes. is good for everybody. <laughs> what a wonderful day. And as Ken w had pointed out many times, we can uh, relax on that day and dwell upon God and read His scriptures. When we're, if we're busy on the other days, then certainly we can take time out to think about our Lord and what he, all He did for us. Peter had some very interesting things to say relative to our understanding of creation and the flood and so forth. In his second book, Second Peter 3, Three, chapter, uh, verse 3, and I'm going to read these verses. Does this sound like anything that might apply to today? First of all, you must understand that in these last days, now Peter thought maybe he was in the last days, he had no idea it was going to be 2,000 years, but in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. What kind of people are those? Do those sound like God-fearing people? Not really. They will mock you and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died. And everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Does that sound like a familiar story? They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water, the water, was, uh, the, water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. Do you think um, he had anything he possibly might have been thinking about evolutionists in our day? Yeah, I think he was trying to say there was a flood and God created. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there are people who have problems with that. At the end of time, there's going to be people who have problems with that. Yeah. And we live in a day when that whole thing is being fulfilled in our ears, and, and think in about our schools. What, think about <laughs> what the real issues are here. These people want to deny, by every means possible, any supernatural intervention in the history of our world. In fact, maybe even the existence of the supernatural. What would that do if there were no supernatural you know, intervention in our world? How, how would that impact us individually? We would cease to exist in a moment. We would cease to exist in the moment. Acts, um, let me just read a couple of verses relative to that, which we went past, but I thought we probably should go back to. It's found in Acts 17, verses 25 and 28. And this is Paul's speech to the Athenians. <coughs> Dor, nor does he, talking about God, need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. 
And then dropping down to verse 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. As it were, that puts teeth in the idea that without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> exactly. You can't even have another heartbeat. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> we as Seventh-day Adventists, what about us on the Sabbath? Is it, um, are we just, we just like to be different? We've been given these three angels' messages, and the message of, if you look at the message of Revelation 14 there, verses 6 to, to 12, there are many parallels between that and the fourth commandment. Does that say anything to it, to us? Do we owe to the world to tell them about the judgments that are coming? Are we embarrassed to speak up for the truth of the Sabbath? To speak up on behalf of God, the God we worship? We need to remember that the good news is not about us. It's not about us individually. It's not about our church. The good news is about God. And we should never be embarrassed to speak about God. And so at the end of the time, we will see that there will be two days proposed on which men are to worship. On the one hand, the Sabbath, linked to all that God has accomplished throughout history, versus Sunday, which is the devil's day of worship, on the other. Now, if you worship on Sunday, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not trying to condemn you in any way. But I would like to suggest to you that the Sabbath, with all of its meanings compiled down through history, that God keeps piling more and more reasons for celebrating the Sabbath, you're missing out on those things if you worship on Sunday. Satan knows that any group of people who correctly and fully celebrate the seventh-day Sabbath will be able to resist his power. No wonder he works so unceasingly at attacking the validity of the seventh-day Sabbath. The devil certainly understands that if he can lead us to doubt the truthfulness of the seventh-day creation week, and especially if he can get us to doubt the entire creation story, our reason for keeping the Sabbath is seriously compromised. You think that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been benefited or weakened by the keeping of the Sabbath? Well, I'm not quite sure if I'd call Sunday the devil's day of worship. Um, I the, would say that the lack of worship on Saturday mm -hmm. may be influenced by the devil. Okay. Well, look how the devil has tried to distract, made you feel like you're out of step with the world. Mm -hmm. Evolution is taken away from creation. He takes Sunday and, and pulls you away from the Sabbath. Where the Bible, Jesus went to church on the Sabbath. All of his disciples went to church on the Sabbath. We're followers of Jesus. So why? There's nothing in the Bible that says that you're to go any other day. And But Satan is just making us feel um, odd man out to uh, follow his direct, uh, follow. Well, and, and that's my point now, and I asked this question, let me ask it again. Do we just like being different? Is that why we keep the Sabbath? No, no I think mm -hmm. there, are, there are specific reasons. I think many great reasons have been given. Exodus, Deuteronomy, uh, Revelations, we mentioned in the book of Hebrews also. I'd like to say if, you know, if you're wondering if you're a Christian, should you keep the Sabbath? Uh, we talked about Hebrews chapter 4. Specifically, verse 9 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. So, it's, yeah. there's clearly a Sabbath for the Christians. It's the same Sabbath that Adam and Eve followed. It's the, same, it's the same Sabbath throughout the entire Bible. There's no mystery here. We can read it clearly. Uh, the Bible is filled with many mysteries or parables and things like that, but here it says it clearly. There is a Sabbath. There are, there are commandments about it. It seems, it seems like this is something that God wants us to do because it's a present for us. It's a wonderful thing to help keep us close to Him. It's a sign between Him and His people. We're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But this seems to be a way that God can kind of 
keep us along, keep us on the right path. There are those who say that the Sabbath is what's held the Seventh-day Adventist Church together as a, a worldwide organization since, since our inception. Do you think that's true? Jim, the, uh, he wrote this book. Do you have any um, final thoughts as our time mm -hmm. is ending on these questions? Well, I, th I see in Sabbath a, a, a richness of meaning that goes mm -hmm. to, to places I never thought of before. A good reference on that is Sigmund Tonstedt's book, mm -hmm. The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I see as a meaning of the Sabbath is it reflects my faith in the God who created by the power of His Word. Mm -hmm. He's the kind of God who has no limitations. He doesn't need any time to work on things. And therefore, I can pray to Him and there's a reasonable expectation that He is able to do anything that needs to be done. Sometimes He chooses not to do things the way I wish He would, or, or I thought that I wished. Won. Yes. But I know that He can, yes. and that gives me great confidence that because He can, and because He's wise, and because the creation was very good, and that's His intention, He will do the best for me, whether I realize what's best or not. He does. Yeah, yes, right. very good. We need to take a bigger view of all these things, and, and I'm reminded of that by reading Education, the book of Ellen White, page 173, paragraph 2. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by man's power, ambition, or caprice. But in the Word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests mm -hmm. and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently patiently working out the counsels of his own will. God is still there. He's still working. And one of the ways in which he works is to say, let's get together. Let's have a meeting every Sabbath. Because the Sabbath reminds us of creation. It reminds us of redemption. We were, the, the Israelites were freed from slavery on that day. It reminds us of the salvation we, we experienced because Christ rested in the grave over the Sabbath. And if we read Isaiah 66, it, remind, it, it helps us to look forward to the Sabbaths we're going to celebrate in the future. So all through history, there are constant guideposts that say, celebrate the Sabbath, celebrate the Sabbath, celebrate the Sabbath, celebrate the Sabbath, because it talks about all the ways in which I want to relate to you, I want you to relate to me, God speaking, and we can be together as a family. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. We want to thank Dr. Gibson from being with us again. See you next week.